believe that God has a promise for you, a plan for you, a purpose for you. I don't know about you, but as we were singing this song, and we're talking about God's blessings, I hope that you understand that he has a blessing in store for you. And here's what I mean, and I said this in first service, and I want to tell you guys this as well. It's how you see God dramatically changes the way that you receive God. Because the God that you see is the God that you get. Because in the New Testament, in the book of Mark, there's a story in chapter 6 where Jesus goes back to his hometown. And he's in the synagogue and he's teaching and all the people are like, well, who is this guy? Isn't this the guy that just grew up in our neighborhood? He goes, how can he be doing these miracles? And it goes on to say that a prophet is without honor in his hometown. He could only do a few miracles. So some people were getting healed, but the reason why is because the God that you see is the God that you get. The people in his hometown saw a carpenter. So when you see a carpenter, you can get your house fixed. But when you see Christ, you can get your life fixed. So the way that you see God is the way that you can receive him. So then when we're singing this song about a blessing and that God is for you and he is for your family and he's for your marriage and he's for your business and he's for your personal, you have to know that I got to believe that. Because if you just see God as someone who saves you, yeah, you'll get salvation. But when you see God as the one that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that anyone thinks or imagines, that's the God that you'll get. And I just want to pray for us before we start service today. That we would begin to receive and see God differently. Maybe you came in here today and you saw him as just a carpenter, a good man. But I hope today that your life will be changed, that you will begin to see him as Christ, your Lord and your Savior and someone who has a plan for your life. So God, I pray that right now we would open our hearts. God, I pray that we would receive today. God, I pray no, no matter what stigma or, or maybe we would break out of the box that maybe we grew up in, Lord, and we thought, Lord, we knew what church was about. We thought we knew what religion was about. We thought we knew what you were about. But God, I pray that we would see you differently today so that we can receive all that you have in store for us, the blessing over us, God. And we thank you for all that you're going to do and for all that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen, church. Hey, if you do me a favor and turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be a good day today. Amen. Amen. Well, some of you might be wondering who I am. I am, uh, if you realize, according to size, I'm Pastor Landon's twin, okay? <laughs> oh, it hurts me when you laugh like that, Emily. <laughs> Just joking. Well, hey, it's such an honor to be here. My name is Ari, and I'm down from the valley. Uh, me and my wife, we campus pastor at Church of Dream City, and uh, uh, we're just so thrilled to be here with you guys this weekend with Bridge. Uh, I know my wife has been here on many occasions. I've been here on a midweek, but never on a Sunday service, and so I'm excited to spend some time with you here today. Allison always comes back and she's raving about everything that you guys are doing. We follow you from afar on social media and, uh, you know, Pastor Landon and Emily, they are some amazing people. We've done ministry with them. We, we go back about 19 years, okay, when we did ministry school together. And so it's just amazing to see what God is doing through them here in the Flagstaff community. Uh, and I just love their heart. You know, this church and what it, it in, the church and the responsibility of impacting the community uh, and just bringing people to Jesus this being that bridge. And uh, could we just give it up for your pastors right now? Just, I know uh, you guys are very gracious because they've been on sabbatical this month. You've been hearing from all these other people, but I know that you guys are itching to hear uh, from your pastor. And so I know he, God has put a word on his heart for this church as you step into a new season. Uh, and we just can't wait to see what God is going to continue to do through the Bridge Church. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time with you today, and I just want to share, I feel like, something that God has placed on my heart. And the amazing, the amazing thing about God is God's the only one that can speak something to all of us, but then speak something different to each of us all at the same time. Have you realized that? Like God will speak to us, and we're like, oh yeah, we all needed that. But then someone will walk away and feel like, oh man, God spoke directly to me. 
And I love it because that's God's compassion for you, to show you that he sees you where you're at, to let you know that he knows the situation that you're walking into, and he's going to come alongside you and use an orator, a preacher of the gospel, to confirm what God is doing in your life so that you realize that he does have a purpose and a plan for you. So today, I want you to raise your expectations a little bit and realize that you can receive a word from God because he is speaking to all of us, but also to each of us. And if we can receive that, I believe that God is going to do some great things this morning. So here's the thing I want to ask you, though, before we dive into this. How many of you guys love gifts? How many of you love to receive gifts? You know, there's the love language test. They say that your love tank is filled by receiving gifts. That's you. You know, sometimes it's words of affirmation or acts of service. But there's how many gift givers do we, gift receivers do we love? All right, I see you out there. Well, you know, when it comes to gifts, there's kind of one or two camps that you can fall into. Because how many of you guys have ever received a gift and you kind of said this thing, oh, you shouldn't have. And it, and it was not like a being out of courteous, but it's like, really, you shouldn't have because this gift doesn't matter. Anyone ever fall into that category before? Like, you're like, you should have saved your money type of thing. Well, there, there's two components, though, that come into this if you've received a gift and if you've ever said anything like that. You know, if you've ever received the sweater that you know you'll never wear or the thigh master that you didn't ask for or the socks that don't fit, you kind of fall into one category. Either you are, you are the person that is the exchanger or you are the reluctant holder honor. Okay, and I know that's not a word, but it's a word today. And so simply meaning, you're the exchanger. Someone gives you a gift, and you're like, oh, you shouldn't have. But then you think to yourself, you know what? They would want me to be happy. They would want me to be able to open this gift and have just joy. And so you know what? I'm going to take this gift, and I'm going to return it and exchange it for something better. Anyone ever fall into that category there? You feel like people want you to be happy. You're going to exchange it. That's my wife right there. She's, she's no shame right there. She's I return all of his gifts. Or maybe, maybe you fall into the reluctant holder honor. And so you just have a heart for people. Like you just love people and you're like, oh, you know, they gave you the gift. It's the thought that counts. Yes, I'll, no, I'll never use it. And I don't want to hurt their feelings. And so what do you do? You put the gift in the closet. And then whenever they come over, you put the gift out. You put it on. And like, oh, you were in the gift. Oh, I love it so much. And you really don't love it. But you just love people. How many fall into that category? You'll just hold on to it <laughs> even though you don't like it at all. You know, speaking about gifts, and, and I'm actually a pretty good gift giver for my wife. I've, I've done done pretty well. We'd be married, what is it, 17 years this October. And so, uh, but let me share one of these underwhelming gift experiences I've actually had within my lifetime, okay, with Allison. So it was our first year of marriage, okay. Uh, someone gifted us a time to go spend up in Sedona, and so we went there for the weekend, and so we knew that we wanted to exchange some gifts, okay. And so if you know, if you try to follow the anniversary plan, you know, each year is a different thing, okay. And so the first year is paper, the second year is like cotton, third year, you go on, so on, so on, so on. So we knew that the first year was paper, and so In our minds, we're thinking, okay, we got to exchange gifts. It has to do with paper. And so then Allison gives me this gift. We're we're at dinner. We're revealing these things. And and so she gets me this jar. And it's 365 ways that I love you. And so I pull them out. And so every day I can get this. They're like on construction paper, all different colors. And I'm pulling them out of the jar. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. Like this is her form of a gift in paper. Plus it's my love language, words of affirmation. So I'm like, this is amazing. And so then. Here in my mind, though, because she gave me her gift, I had the gift for her. And this is where we get into trouble because over this course of our first year of marriage, you know, we're moving in together. We, we have this stuff going. We're, we're living life. And, and she kept saying, I'd like a paper shredder. You know, that's what I need. I need a paper shredder for all of my stuff. So she gives me this gift, okay? So in my mind, I'm like, genius, paper. So she gives me the gifts, 365 ways that I love you. I open up the trunk, and I pull out the state of art paper shredder and say, happy anniversary. True story. We have never exchanged anniversary gifts ever again. I'm telling you. (laughs) No lie. We're just like, you know, let's just buy our own gifts. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking paper associated. She said she wanted a paper shredder. That did not go well. I'm telling you. Don't buy your wife a paper shredder for your anniversary gift. So, but I think we've all been in situations, though, where we've opened a gift and we think, I wish I could change that, or I wish I could get something different, or I wish I got what he had or she had. But my question for you today is, do you ever find yourself looking in the mirror and asking the same thing? I wish I could change what's inside of me. I wish I could be more of a patient parent. 
I wish I could be more successful in life. Or I wish I knew more about God's word and his purpose for me. Or I wish I was more like him or more like her. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. Because I think God's word has something to say to those who have felt that way when they've looked in the mirror and they thought the gift that God placed in them wasn't enough to make a difference in their life, in the people's life around them. So we're going to look at the Bible, and there's two people that I want to point out because these two guys have a similar story when it starts off, but in the end of their life, it turns out completely different. The first person that we're going to look at is Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, and we see his story begin in 1 Samuel chapter 9. The second person that I want us to look at is David. David was the second king of Israel. And so we're going to see that their stories start out similar. And so this is what we're going to see. We're going to see three truths that are true about Saul and David. And this is where their stories begin. So to give you a little background about Saul. Saul now, he is on his way. His family has lost some donkeys within the land. And so Saul and his servant are tasked to going to find these donkeys. And so they're out there. They're looking. They can't find him. And then all of a sudden, his servant has this great idea. He says, hey, there's a prophet Samuel who lives in the land. Why don't we go and see him? And maybe he can tell us where these donkeys are. He's a prophet. He knows everything. Let's go ahead and let's kind of talk to him to see if he can help us. So Saul thinks this is a great idea. So Saul and his servant go to Samuel's house. But before Samuel, or before they even get to Samuel's house, Samuel comes and he meets him. And he says, I have a message for you, Saul. And this is the message that he has in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. He says, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I'm doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. Could you imagine that? Saul's on the search for donkeys. That's what he's doing. He's in the wilderness looking for donkeys, and all of a sudden, the man of God comes to him and says, hey, you've got an assignment by God, and you are going to be the first king of Israel, the first king of all of his people. He's putting you in charge of the nation. It's amazing. It's crazy to think about. Then we travel on about six chapters later, and we see David come into this story. Now, his story doesn't start with him looking for donkeys. We know that his actually story starts with him tending to sheep because he's a shepherd. Now, Samuel, that same prophet that anointed Saul, comes to Jesse's house, and he's looking for the second king of Israel. And so as he comes to the house, he's there. He sees these seven brothers of David, and he goes one by one. Nope, 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 nope. And all of a sudden, he's like, Jesse, do you have any more sons? Because I know the Lord sent me to anoint the next king. And so he says, I've got one more tending to sheep in the flock. So they go and get him. David walks into the house, and then Samuel knows that this is the man. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it says this. So as David stood among his brothers, Samuel took a flask of olive oil, and he brought that he had brought and anointed David with oil. Sounds a lot like what we just read about Saul, am I right? And it says, and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. You see, what I want to point out today is that within this story, we're introduced to Saul and we're introduced to David. And the three truths that begin to stand about their lives are true about both of them. And here are the truths that I want to point out. The first truth is that they were called to it. Both Saul and David had a calling on their life from God. God had a purpose for them. And it's clear because it says that they anointed them with oil. And so we can clearly see that this was the mandate to be be able to be the king of Israel was there was anointing from the prophet. And so we saw Saul receive it and we saw David receive it. They were both called to it. The second truth that we begin to see is that they were both gifted for it. You see, gifting in the Bible is the means that God gives you to carry out the calling that he has placed in your life. God appointed them, he called them, but he's also going to gift them to be able to do that. We see that the Spirit of God in both verses, it says that the Spirit of God fell powerfully upon each of them, upon Saul and upon David. God gave them what they needed in order for the call that he had placed on their life. I want to let you know that's encouraging. Because God calls each and every single one of us. But not only does he call you, but he'll gift you to be able to fulfill the calling that he has placed on there. 
the calling that he's asking you to do to make a difference, whether it be in your own life, whether it be in your family's life, whether it be in your community, whether it be in your workplace, God will prepare you for what he is positioning you for within your life. And the third thing that we see that's a truth about this, so not only were they called to it, not only were they gifted for it, but others could see it. Others could see it within their life. We're told that as Saul was on his way home that the Spirit of God fell powerfully upon him. And then he began to prophesy. So all the people began to say, what is Saul a prophet now? They were amazed at this gifting that was placed upon his life. They could see that God was all over him. And then we just read that the Spirit of God came powerfully upon David and that everyone began to recognize it. In fact, one day, as Saul is looking for somebody to help him, he's calling out to his servants. He's like, he's being tormented, and he just, he couldn't get this evil spirit away. And so what did they do? They called David, who was a musician, who the power of God fell upon him, and he was able to soothe Saul's, you know, his torments that he was facing within his life. See, God gifted David to be able to do that. Not only was he a shepherd, he was a musician, he's a leader, he is a military person. We're going to see what God begins to do within David's life. But let's be honest, when we look at giftings in other people, isn't it a lot easier to see it in other people? Isn't it easier to see it in other people than it is to maybe see it within yourself? You're like, oh, yeah, they're gifted to do this. They're gifted to speak. They're gifted to be with people. They're gifted to serve. They're gifted to raise money. And we can see it in all these other people. But sometimes when it comes to us, the reality check is like when we look in the mirror, we don't see it. We feel like we don't amount to much, that we're not adequate to be used by God. And we continue to see these things take place, and we don't have to look far. For instance, let me give you an example. We can see the life of Mother Teresa, and we see that she was gifted for compassion, right, to love and to serve people. We can see that all over the life of Mother Teresa. Or maybe you can look at the life of Martin Luther King Jr., and we see that he was gifted to inspire and encourage just and motivate people to action as what he did in that day. And we can see that all over his life. Or maybe you could see people like Giannis Antetokounmpo and say that he's gifted to never get a foul called in the NBA Finals. Am I right? Man, I'm still a little bitter from that. He should have fouled out three games at least. But no, no ref ever called a foul. He was gifted to never receive the foul. Again, sometimes it's easier to see the giftings in other people than it is within ourselves. But the question is, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard as followers of Christ to look in the mirror and to see that God has gifted each and every single one of us too? Why is it hard to see that, yes, other people are gifted, but we feel like maybe God handed out giftings. There's one for you, one for you, one for you, you, you don't get one. Like, why do we feel like that sometimes where he gives them to everybody else but uh, you? The thing is that you have to understand that we have all been gifted. You see, he's gifted us just as he's gifted Saul and David. But instead, what happens is that we look in the mirror and we see every single gap within our life. We focus on our shortcomings. We focus on the negative things. And so we don't focus on the giftings that God's places in our hands. We just, place, we just focus on ourselves and what we don't have and what we're not doing and why we can't do something. And the thing is, as long as we continue to fo- focus on the gaps, we'll always miss what God is trying to give us. When we, when we always focus on the, be- the negative things, we'll always miss what God is trying to place within our hands. And so you've got to be reminded that you are gifted for it as too. Because the truth is, if you're a follower of Christ, the three things that we talked about, Saul and David, are true of you. You've been called, you've been gifted, and I'm going to tell you, other people see it too. They see it within your life. And so you have to realize that if we're called to it, so what does that mean if we're called to it? Some of you are like, well, I'm not called to be a pastor or a preacher or stand up on the stage. We're all called, whether you're a vocational minister or not, we're all called to follow Christ. And there's some things that each of us are called to that, are, that we, we all do, and there's some specific callings that God will place on you that maybe no one else can do. So let me give you some of the things that we're all called to. Number one, we're all called to follow Christ. When we receive Christ, it says that we are to be more like him. So what does that look like? In your daily life, you have to develop the spiritual disciplines to continue to follow Christ. And so that means reading our Bible, uh, praying, worshiping, getting into church, getting around a small group, investing into your community. And so you have to realize that we're all called to that. 
that God has given us something. Because you realize it or not, sometimes we think, well, you know, uh, reaching people and all that kind of stuff, that, that's got to be Pastor Lynn and Emily's job to witness and to get people into the church. Like, that's the bridge staff's responsibility. Actually, no, it's not. Because Ephesians tells us that they are to equip the saints, that, that their responsibility is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So who's the saints? We're the saints right here. So as we are following the calling that God has placed on our life, we are stepping out into action and doing what God has called us to do. The second thing that we're supposed to do that is all a similar calling that we have is that not only are we to follow Christ, but we are to love God and love people. In Matthew, they're asked, what is the greatest commandment? Well, they say it's to love God and love people. So your relationship with God has got to be solid, but then your relationship with people has to be solid. And that's a calling that we all share, that we need to love people, that we love God. And then the third one that is a similar calling that we each have is that we're called to make disciples. The last thing he says is to go out into all the world and make disciples, to preach the good news, the gospel. How many of you guys have been impacted by Bridge Church lately? How many of you guys have been impacted by the Spirit of God and what God, how many of you guys, your life has been radically changed? How many of you can say that if I look back where I was, I'm not where I used to be because the Spirit of God and what He has done through this place? Well, guess what? You got to talk about it. You've got to talk about it. You got to talk about the goodness of God. Sometimes when we look at this idea of going out and telling people and evangelism, we kind of we clam up because we think, well, it's going door to door. It's preaching from the stage. But, you know, really evangelism is birthed out of relationship. And when you tell people, man, you know, if you would have seen my life a year ago, you know, if this, if you, would, you wouldn't have believed what God has done with my It's just talking about it. And I think too often we make evangelism something that's so distant. Actually, evangelism is a spiritual discipline, just like praying and reading your Bible. And when you start talking about what God is doing, what, you start talking about your church, you start talking about the things that you're doing to impact the community, that is evangelism. That's going out to the world to make a difference. You've got to carry that mantle because we are all called to go and make disciples. And so those are the things that we share that we all do. But there's some things that maybe are specific to you. Maybe you're in here and God has given you a heart for the foster care system. Maybe you see what's happening. You're like, I know God is not happy with this, and I'm not happy with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my home for respite. I'm going to find ways that I can get into the community and let people know that I want to love on some kids that have felt like they've abandoned because I want to truly show them the heart of God. So maybe God puts that calling upon your life and says, I want to do something like that. Or maybe God has called you to start a business. And so you're like, I want to start a business and I want to create an environment that is healthy for employees to know that they can be who God has called them to be, to use their giftings, and they can experience something that is healthy. And so maybe God has put that on your life to start a business. Or maybe God's called you to be a stay-at-home mom. Sometimes we look at that and we're like, oh, it's just a stay Man, stay-at-home moms, okay? Being a, being a dad of four boys uh, and, and what mothers do to, to just raise the kids. And, I mean, it's amazing what they do. I've, I've done it a few times. When Allison comes up here and she brings up a couple, she leaves me with two. I'm like, how does she do this all the time? Like, I'm just I'm going solo right here. You know, it's like Chick-fil-A for lunch, McDonald's for dinner, pizza for breakfast. Like, you know, but mothers have an incredible ministry. And maybe sometimes mothers don't see that. But I want to tell you that maybe that's the call that God's placed in your life in the season of life that you're in right now. And so you're saying, you know what, maybe my calling is to raise my children, to lay a foundation where they understand who they are in Christ. That they begin to know what their identity is found in Christ. And so maybe that is your calling here today as you begin to look at things. Here's the thing. Not only were they called to it, not only were they, but they were also gifted for it. This is what Romans chapter 12 tells us. It says in verse 6. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then take responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, so do it. It's in you, so do it. That's all you have to realize is that the gifting is inside of you, and he's placed it before you. But I know what maybe some of you are thinking out there today. You're thinking, well, I don't know what my gifting is. I don't know what this calling is that you talk about. You know, there's a career and a calling. A career is what you get paid for. A calling is what you're made for. Sometimes those things come together, 
And sometimes they're separate. So sometimes you might be in the workplace, but then God is going to give you a calling to impact and be used within this church. So you have to realize that God has this calling for you, what he has made you for, and he has placed that gift inside of you. And so I want to help you. If you don't understand maybe what your gift is or, or, or what it might be, you should ask someone. Ask someone. Because like I said, sometimes it's easier to see it in others than it is yourself. So maybe the conversation as you're driving home today or you go to lunch and you're like, hey, what do you, what do you see that I'm good at? Because I promise you, people will be able to identify the things that you're good at. And they're like, oh, well, you're great at this or you're great at that. And it's sometimes you don't always see it, but they see it clearly. And all of a sudden you're reminded, you know what? I do like doing that. I, I, I realize that I, I do like, I get, you know, my, I, I get filled up when I kind of, when someone asks me to serve somewhere or, or to do hospitality. Like, I love doing those things. And when you begin to identify that, that's when you can begin to walk in the gifting that God has placed in every single one of us. You know, I, we were talking one time about uh, one of the ladies within our church, like, you know, they were finding, trying to find a place to serve and do all this stuff. And she says, I love to organize. I'm like, praise the Lord, because I don't like to organize. And so I don't know about you, but if you find yourself, because just you're an organizational genius, like you can just put everything, like you're like Tetris master. Like you realize that that's a gifting because what has happened now is that every time we have events or do th things within our church, we'll ask her and she get, she just lights up. She's like, I'd love to be there. I'd love to serve. I'd love to do that. And she starts organizing and putting everything. So she's using her gift. And thankfully, that's not a gift that I have to put things away. And I see her walking out the gifting that, she's been, uh, that God has given her, and she's being fulfilled. So realize by asking people, trying to determine what that might look like, you will be able to find the gift that God has placed in you. And you can utilize it because when you walk in your gifting, uh, and, and if you've done it before, when you walk in your gifting, there's nothing better than that. When you know, man, God is using me to make a difference, to impact it big or small. So you have to be able to see that God has gifted you because it is in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's in you. Turn to your second choice and say, it's in you too. <laughs> God has given you what you need to carry out your calling that he's placed in your life. But here's the important thing. We've talked about your call to it. We've talked about your gifted. We talked about others can see it in you. But here's what I really want to drill down. Those are similar things. Those are things that happen within our life. But this is really what I want to hit at. What are you going to do with that gifting? Yes, we can identify that we have a gift. But what are we going to do with that gifting? Because in our story between Saul and David, they did two drastically different things. Because of it, David and what he did with his gifting, his name was mentioned 60 times in the New Testament. But because of what Saul did with his gifting, his name was never mentioned again in the New Testament. So what are you going to do with the calling that God has placed in your life? When we pick up the story later on about Saul after he's, you know, as he's getting ready to get anointed, what happens is Samuel ga gathers all of the nation of Israel. And so there's two people that know who's going to be king over Israel. That's Samuel and that's Saul. And so what happens is they, they get everyone to this public place, and Samuel begins to say that the Lord has heard your cries of wanting a king. And so he goes, I'm getting ready to appoint and let you know who the first king of Israel is going to be. And so as they gather him together, Samuel says that he's going to pick the tribe on which the king is going to come from. And guess whose tribe it was? Saul's tribe. Then he goes on to say, I'm going to pick the clan of whose tribe that comes from. Well, guess whose clan that was? Saul's clan. He goes on to say that he's going to pick the family from which that clan is going to come from. Guess whose clan that was? Saul's clan. And then he picks the individual from which that family it represented. And guess whose name he called? Saul. This is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 21. And finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. Saul is selected. He's been called for it. He's been gifted for it. Others can be in, begin to see it within his life. Like it says in the Bible, and they describe him to be head and shoulders above the rest. So everyone begins to see, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's a mighty man. That's, that's a warrior. That's someone that can lead us into battle. That's someone that can lead us into the next territory. And so they see the gifting all over Saul. But what it says is that when they called his name, he was hiding amongst the baggage. All of a sudden, he felt like he did not have what it takes. Even though he was called to it. 
even though he was gifted for it, even though that others could see it, he hid amongst the baggage. And it could seem somewhat humorous, this guy head and shoulders above the rest. But then I thought to myself, how often do we find ourselves hiding amongst the baggage? God has called you. God has gifted you. And all of a sudden, we feel like, I don't have what it takes. I can't do it. God, how could you use me? So we find ourselves hiding amongst the baggage of our past. Our past holds us back. Oh, God could never use anyone like me. My shortcomings, my failures, my mistakes, things I identified with, he couldn't use me. Or maybe it's the baggage of insecurity, your fears, your doubts. What if I step out and and I fail? Or maybe it's the baggage of security. I'm just comfortable here. I'm indifferent. I I, I hear about these things. I I hear about these mission trips going to Mexico. I know they need people to go down there. Um, But I'm just uncomfortable here. I don't have to get in a van and drive kids all the way down there. I'm just comfortable. Even though God maybe has put something within you. We find ourselves just comfortable and not stepping out. Or maybe we find ourselves stuck behind the baggage of busyness. Your schedule, your kid's schedule, work schedule, life schedule. I've just, I just got so many things going on right now. I just, I just don't have time to, to lead a group or get in a ministry. Or I don't have time to serve and I, I don't have time to do any of these things. Or I don't have time for the call that God has placed on my I'm just, my schedule is busy. Or maybe we find ourselves stuck behind the baggage of comparison. I don't have what they have. I'm not a gifted speaker. I can't speak to that. I just, I start sweating when I get around people. Like, you start comparing yourself, and you're just like, I I don't know. How can God use this? So in this story, we see that Saul was stuck behind the baggage with his giftings, with his calling. But this is where I want us to lead us to, to help us understand is that David's story was completely different. You remember David's story as it goes on after he was anointed. His brothers are on the battle lines. And so he goes up and he hears this Philistine, Goliath. He's threatening the nation of Israel. Come, send out your best warrior. And no one's responding. They've been hiding for 40 days. And David's like looking around. He's like, why is no one doing anything about this? So we go on to see that this is what it says. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this Philistine anyways that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? You see, when Saul was called to it, when he was gifted for it, everybody else could see it. He was hiding. But yet when David stepped onto the scene, he says, God, take what I have and use it. And we see that he took the sling and the stone and he defeated Goliath. And he led the nation of Israel into prosperity and to victory and to stepping into the calling that God placed him on him to be that second king of Israel. What are you going to do with the gift that is in you? The call that we all have. I'll be honest, there are days that I find myself amongst the baggage. I wake up and I think, can I really be the husband that I really, that I need to be? Do I have what it takes to be the father that I need to be to my boys? Do I have what it takes to be a pastor to our congregation and and to step out and to lead and do those things? Do I have what it takes? But I want to tell you this, that what you do is not dependent on you, but it's dependent on the spirit that is within you. David and Saul were anointed for a purpose. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon them. I want to tell some of you here today that God has called you. He's gifted you. We can see it. We can see it. But are you willing to step out and say, God, others see it, I might not quite see it, but I'm going to give you what I have. Because I want to be used by you. I want to fill the purpose that you have for my life. Because as you step out, you'll encourage others. 
as you step out and you fulfill your calling, the people around you will begin to fulfill their calling. And then you begin to see the impact that it makes, not only in your life, in your family's life, in your church's life, in your community's life, in your state's you will make the impact because you say, God, here I am. I give it to you. I don't want to be stuck because I think we've all been stuck before. But God is calling you to more. He sent me up from rainy Scottsdale, Arizona this weekend just to tell you it's in you. 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 The call, the gift, it's in you. I want you to stand up to your feet today. And I want to pray for you. Before I give my call, I just want to pray. God, I just pray this right now that you would guard our mind. The tactic of the enemy is always to distract, to always confuse, to always try to discredit the word that's going forth. So God, I pray that we would be in tune with your spirit right now to be reminded it's in us. This is how I want to pray for you here today. I want to pray if there's anyone in here that says, all right, I've been hiding behind the baggage too long. I feel like God is doing something in me. He's called me, and, and I feel like he's got a gift. I, I don't really know what it looks like, but I've, I found myself stuck behind the baggage. So what I want to do is I want to pray for you that you would step out from behind. Whatever it's your past, insecurity, fear, maybe busyness, maybe it's comparison, it's doubt. And you say, you know what, I'm going to answer the call. I'm not going to squander the gift that God has placed in me. So if that's you here today, I want you to come forward. I want it to be a symbolism that you are stepping out from behind the baggage. And I'm going to have Pastor Land and Pastor Emily, I'm going to have my wife Allison, the prayer team. We're going to come up here and we're going to pray for you. And so if that's you in here right now and you say, I'm going to step out from behind the baggage. No longer I'm going to squander this gift. I want you to come down right now. Come on, church. If that's you right now, just go ahead and step on out. Step on out. If that's you, you've got the gift. God's called you. If that's you here today. You've been hiding too long. Come on, we're going to just give you a minute. Come on. If you feel like you've been holding on to that gift too long behind that baggage, we're going to step out right now and answer the call that God has for us because we're going to make a difference in what that looks like. As people are coming forward, we're just going to begin to pray right now. And we're going to pray and we're going to anoint you with oil because as it said, they were anointed with oil, Saul and David were. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon them powerfully. And so maybe you're in here today and you have a calling. Maybe you have, you know that God is doing it, but maybe you just need a fresh touch from God right now. And so if that's you, I would like for you to come down here right now so that we can just anoint you and begin to pray God's power upon you that you will begin to see the Spirit move within your life. And so if that's you, go ahead and come on down and we're just going to take just a minute now and we're going to begin to pray for some people to receive what God has in store for them here today.
Let's all pray. Would you, if you're in your seats, just stretch your hands towards all the people who are here up front. And if, if you've already received that calling and that you'd understand that gifting of your life, then I want you to pray with faith with me. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for everybody who's choosing and make a decision for Christ today, making a decision for their calling today. The Bible says if I we deny him before men, he'll deny us before our Father. And so, Lord, these are people who are saying, I will not be denying you, Lord, in front of others. God, I am stepping into my calling. I'm stepping into my gifting, and I'm going to become all that you created me to be. And, Lord, I thank you for every single person that is here in person and online, whether they're in a prison cell or in a house or in a car, wherever they're tuning in today. I pray that everybody would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which imparts all the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And, Lord, we thank you that you are working in all and through all. And, Lord, I thank you, God, that you're moving in each and every one of our lives today. Lord, it's not going to just be pastors and leaders, God, Lord, who see miracle signs and wonders follow them, but all those who follow you, these things will follow them. And Lord, I thank you, God. There's going to be men and women, Lord, this week. I want you to pray with me. There's going to be men and women this week that go into hospitals and see people healed. There's going to be men and women who go into their job place and see people saved for the glory of God. There's going to be people, God, who walk into their schools as school gets ready to begin again. And they're going to see lives changed and disciples made and boldness and courage fill their lungs and fill their heart and begin to speak about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, that we're not just going to change our forward no more. We're going to change all of northern Arizona. This will become a global ministry around the world. And Lord, the 130 churches that we've already planted, God, Lord, that's only a beginning of what you're about to do. And I thank you that multiplication is about to happen, God, Lord, through this ministry, through this house, and through every church preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you. It's not about our name, but it's about your name. And it's not about a denomination, but it's about the dominion of Jesus Christ throughout the whole earth. And I thank you, God, for what you have done and for what you will do. And all God's people who received a good word today gave God some praise right now. Come on, let's give God a good praise. You can find your seat if you want to, or you can stay up to the front, but whatever you do, stay standing. I'm going to dismiss, and we're going to dismiss from this place, but not from his presence. And I encourage you to take that little bit of homework that Arian gave you today and just get in the car. This is good, fun homework. Just say, hey, talk good about me. (laughs) Right? Isn't that fun? Tell me something good about myself. Because you know what? That's, that's incur- Well, one of the things that we've tried to do in Christianity is be the gauge of someone else's confidence. I've heard it too much. Well, I don't want to talk. I don't want to make your head too big. Who made you the, the, the confidence police? I'm pretty sure that the Holy Spirit will be my, my guide, my gauge and my compass. How about we do like Paul said, and every day that ends with why you encourage each other. And you talk something good about it. We, we have enough people talking trash about everybody else. Can we just talk good about each other and love on each other from now on and say, hey, you're doing better than you think? We don't need to be that. I'm not the pride police. It's not my job. But I am here to just impart people and just encourage people. And you are too. And so let's let that be the, the message. I, Emily and I have been so thankful for our staff and our team and these incredible guest speakers. Gosh, Arian, Arian is coming back. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, and, and, and I'm so thankful to, to hear such a powerful, I, I almost just like a kindred spirit, him and I, and how we even communicate. And I, I can feel that anointing and, and I just received so much from it. And this month that I've been able to be, oh, listen guys, if you don't know much about church, for a pastor to be on sabbatical for almost a month and you're only three years old, that's a pretty big deal. That's a huge sign of great maturity in the church and a wonderful sign of strength in the staff and the support team. And that's just phenomenal. And so I have been refreshed and recharged and guys, four weeks off of preaching, I'll tell you what, I may preach for a couple hours next week. It's going to be, it's going to be a good one next week. And, and, and we're going to launch a whole new series called breathe. Everybody take a deep breath in and let it out. Hopefully you have good breath. Okay. We're going to talk about breathe next week that, Hey, guess what? You can go to a grocery store and breathe again and not worry about coughing and what people are going to think and have to tell them, Oh, it's just a, <clears throat> just clearing my throat. We're going to breathe again. The Ruach of God, which means the breath of God, the wind of God. 
Oh, a fresh breath of God is about to fill this place. And, and Arian, it, Pastor Arian did a phenomenal job just leading us right into what God's about to do. And I'm so thankful. So don't miss out next week. We've got not only I get to preach and I, and I love the honor to do so, but we also during second service, we have our summer interns who are graduating. We're going to pray over them. We're going to bless them. And then our third service, we have pastors Doug and Siobhan, our executive pastors who we're going to ordain and set in as our executive pastors here in this house. Wonderful. Uh, so thankful. If you can't see them up here, it's because they're in the back right over there trying to hide. Back up. No, I'm just kidding. They like that back row over there because it, the, the, all the lights up here, Pastor Doug's like, y'all can have that up front. I'm going to have it up back so I don't get a headache every five seconds. Uh, but, man, we're so thankful for them, and we're so thankful for what God has done and what God's about to do. And, and I'm so thankful for you and your families. Bring a row. No, no, don't just bring somebody. Bring a row next week, and let's fill up all three services as we prepare to go back to four services. Let's speak this bridge declaration and be dismissed. I am a bridge builder. This is my season of favor. I am blessed to live my best. I will choose to love him first. I will worship fully, love deeply, and my community will thrive because I am praying for it. I am a carrier of peace. I will represent God's gentleness to myself and others. I will live out his gospel. I am blessed to live my best because I am a bridge builder. Amen. God bless you, Bridge. Have a great week. We're so glad you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision, whether that was dedicating your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, send us an email at info at weirbridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you're joining our Bridge Church family online for the first time, we have a very special gift for you. Send us an email at info at wearebridge.church to share some information on where we can send you that gift. We're so glad you joined us today, and we can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to stay connected, because we're so much better. Together. Together.